I'm Ann Marcus. I'm Dean of the School of Education at New York University, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Um, as you can see, looking around the room, uh, there's a wonderful uh, spirit of interest in higher education and public issues in our university and in our city, and we're being watched by our law school's founders, which I think is probably a good thing. It's a little, uh, it's a little awesome in its own way, so if you, uh, if you find yourself wondering, look at one of these guys and he'll get you right back into focus. Um, I started thinking about City University over the summer when there were a lot of things going on in New York, in the press and in conversations. And it occurred to me that um, <clears throat> there had not been a major, really public kind of discussion of higher education for New York City and for the state uh, and questions of higher education in the public interest for quite a long time in New York. And so I started talking to a few friends, including our panelists, about what we might do. Um, and when my be concerns became known around the university, um, many people said to me, why are you interested in this? You're not a CUNY person or you're an NYU person. And so I answered, well, that I am a CUNY person, that I started my career in New York um, many, many years ago at City University when I was the most junior assistant, like something below a grade seven uh, <laughs> at City University before there were a lot of community colleges and before when I guess open admissions was a gleam in Al Bowker and Julius Edelstein's eye. And so I sort of grew up with that and went to LaGuardia Community College. But then I thought, having given that answer for about a month, I thought recently, that's a really stupid answer. Why should I say, why do I need to establish my credentials as being a CUNY person to have an interest in public higher education in this city and this state? And I think that what has happened and what needs to happen is that there needs to be a community of interest that is far beyond the walls of City University. And that the discussion isn't simply how do people in CUNY feel about what's happening, but how do people in New York City and the state and across the country feel about planning for higher education in the public interest. And so I'm hoping that today is going to be part of one of the many efforts going on around our city to stimulate more discussion and thought about this. I think the particular focus on CUNY, because we could certainly have an equally um, challenging dialogue about State University of New York, and I know some of you are here from the State University of New York, which has a somewhat similar but also very different set of issues at the moment, or we could have a similar discussion about almost any other public system in the country. But the reason I thought we should focus on City University, at least for part of our discussion today, is that it really is quite unique in its ambition and its history. And one of the things that's happened is in the last 25 years, uh, there hasn't been a full discussion, really, of what were the goals behind open admissions. It wasn't simply opening the doors. Uh, sort of randomly and without thought. There was a whole plan, there were lots of ideas, lots of thoughts. And I thought it would be good to have a review of that and a review of what's happened since the beginning of open admissions. I think we also need to look at the goals for City University and any public system in terms of the economic development of the state, the mix of higher education institutions and how they work together, um, as well as the opportunity for whom, opportunity for what and for whom uh, that's at the bottom of all this. Um, <clears throat> having said all that, I would like to really introduce our speakers and the format for today will be each speaker will speak 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I was at a very nice, interesting forum at Baruch College the other day and there was this little beeper that went off at the end of some amount of time, but given that beepers don't mean what they used to, everyone in the audience kept looking at their watches and, you know, feeling for things, and I didn't think that was very effective. So our speakers are very disciplined people, and I've told them that if they're really going way over time, I'll sort of get up and cough and tug at them or something really much more primitive. Um, so no beepers today. Um, our first, and I'll introduce them briefly now. I think most of them need no introduction, not much. Um, and then they will in, each in turn speak, and then we will have a period of questions where I hope you will direct questions uh, to one of the speakers. If not, it's a general question. I will ask one of them to answer. And so we really encourage your participation um, and look forward to it. Our first speaker is Augusta Kapner, uh, who... <laughs> is also a CUNY person, deep down, uh, originally, and um, 
you know from her bio that was on our brochure, you know that she is now uh, president of Bank Street College and she has been an assistant secretary of education most recently and before that was acting president of City College of New York for two years and before that was uh, president of Man Borough of Manhattan Community College for many years and before that um, was at the central office of City University and before that was at LaGuardia Community College where I first met her. Um, and she's one of those LaGuardia Community College people, and I'm looking at Janet Lieberman when I say this, who just won't stop fussing about things that are in the public interest. And so she's part of a long tradition there. Um, our next speaker will be Sherry Penny, uh, who again, like Augusta Kapner, has had a career <clears throat> in both the public and private sectors of higher education. And when I first met Sherry Penny, she was Associate Provost at Yale, and has since then been Vice Chancellor of State University of New York for Academic Affairs for many years and is now Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts at Boston. And so she has many perspectives to bring us. And our third speaker is Patrick Callan, who until about a year ago was simply a name that came across uh, my radar screen now and then as someone who was doing extraordinarily important work out in California and is one of the few people who's managed to develop a whole policy center uh, outside of any institution of higher education that is truly neutral and independent and has since in the last year um, with a lot of support from important uh, foundations interested in higher education become a national center and he brings to us a comparative perspective of having worked now in many states on issues of government, uh, long-term planning, policy process and access in particular. So it's a special, pl I should say that also, I thought it would be really wonderful to have someone come in. You know, I sort of thought of New York City as a little town in the old wild west where things are getting a little out of control. And I don't know, I don't know enough about cowboy folklore to know whether you get Wyatt Earp or somebody. Uh, I don't know the good guys from the bad guys, but I thought we need someone like that to come in. And so Pat Callan, I thought of it in that role. And I look forward to what he has to say. So with no further ado, I would like to start with Augusta Kaplan. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this forum. Mostly thank you for calling this forum, because I think for those of us who uh, care very intensely about education in the city, uh, that we hope it will contribute to creating a better and deeper and more productive dialogue about the future of higher education in this city and in this state. Uh, I thought that I would uh, start by, since this is in part about wh where we will go with CUNY and higher education uh, in, in the state and the city, I thought I would start with a little bit of where we've been, because it really is quite helpful to know uh, how we got to where we are today, uh, and particularly to think about um, some of the unique, unique aspects of, of this university that many of us have been affiliated with. Um, as, as all of you know, uh, the City University began as the Free Academy back in 1847. It was almost the first municipal uh, college uh, and academy in the United States. I'm told there was another one, but that one wasn't free. And it started with some very, very ambitious goals. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, try to at least read to you the famous quote from Horace Webster that uh, we were so fond of in the university, that the experiment is to be tried whether the highest education can be given to the masses, whether the children of the people, the children of the whole people can be educated, and whether an institution of learning of the highest grade can be successfully controlled by the popular will, not by the privileged few. As CUNY, as the free university began, it began in a time where the population of New York City was growing, where New York City had uh, a half million inhabitants, had only two major colleges that were serving all of a little over 200 uh, folks. Uh, one of those uh, universities went on to become <laughs> where we are located today. So in starting this free university, it was in reaction to the forces of urbanization, the forces of democratization, and the forces of secularization. Universities were still tied at that time to their theological origins, and many still are today. And it was in part in reaction to the existence of a working man's party in New York City, which was pressing and pressing and pressing for universal free education. It's important to note that there were no high schools in New York City at that time, no public high schools. 
and that this academy was really put together to serve many, many functions. To serve the function of being a high school, of being a college, of being a polytechnic, of giving classical education, and also of preparing for work. A pretty ambitious agenda for any, for any college. When it opened, you had to be 13 years old to, be enter, to enter the Free Academy because it was serving as a, as a uh, recipient uh, to the feeder schools, if you will, which were much younger at that time. And of course, it was all male. It was not until the 1940s, I believe it was, that women uh, were, uh, entered the Free Academy. Free public education, higher ed in, in New York, was really under attack from the very beginning. It was attacked, of course, by private institutions who saw it as a competitor. It was attacked by folks from the parochial and private uh, lower schools. Uh, since when it was set up, it was set up for graduates of the public schools. Uh, and those folks were not originally included. And as time went on, admissions began to change. Uh, some compromises were made, and toward the end of the century, the first century, uh, we began to be able to admit, for example, graduates of private and parochial schools, which at that time was different from its original uh, admissions criteria. The arguments that took place in, that, in the second half of the last century around the Free Academy were remarkably similar to those that we heard in the 60s and 70s. Who should go to college? Does free tuition really provide opportunities to the underprivileged? What should be the role of government, especially the state, in supporting free tuition? What is the impact of a free public college on existing private colleges? The original student population of the Free Academy uh, were uh, white Americans of many generations. That began to change uh, later in the century as the new immigrants began to arrive and with more difficulty than is usually acknowledged, uh, took their place uh, at what is by then becoming the City College. By the beginning of this century, 75% of the population at the then City College was Jewish. We had seen the big immigration from Eastern Europe uh, and from Russia, and that was the new population that this university was serving right then. By, by the beginning of, the first se of this century, we also began to get the sense that at least one of the major private universities in the city um, was not so unhappy with the existence of a city college because in essence, um, the immigrants who were coming in were being excluded from many of the private independent colleges and it was kind of a safety valve function where they were being accepted to what was becoming the city college. Uh, as, we, as we come into this century, the pressures for expansion on higher education begin to increase. They begin to increase uh, with immigration. They begin to increase as more people are working and still want education. So you have the formation of yet another uh, very interesting part of the, of the university, which was the City College Adult Division the first adult baccalaureate municipal uh, free program in the United States. Admissions policies, as you look back over the history of what is now the City University, seem to be controlled primarily by supply and demand. And I'd like to just read you a little quote from uh, Sherry Gorlick's uh, very wonderful book, City College and the Jewish Poor. And it, it's a City College alumnus who is speaking. And he says, when I entered CCNY in 1924, the entrance requirement was simply 60% high school average, or 65% regents average. When I started teaching there in 1928, the entrance requirement was still 60%. In 1930, with the influx of applications for admission, I watched the entrance requirement go upward year by year from 60 to 65, 68, 70, 72, 75, 78, 80, 82, 85, and 88 by the time I left the college in 1941. The reason for this escalation has absolutely nothing to do with academic standards, but everything to do with economics. The college had only so many seats that could be filled by entering freshmen. Those for whom there were no room had to be excluded. The, exca the escalating entrance average was an economically based exclusionary technique designed to cope with a surge of students. Therefore, open admissions in 1970 was a reversion to the tradition of open admissions for high school students considered in your uh, high school students that had obtained from 1847 to 1930. 
All the Jewish students considered in your study were the beneficiaries of open admissions. Neither I nor many other Jewish students could have entered CCNY had the entrance requirements been 88, as they were in the period from 1941 to 1969. By the 60s, uh, it was required that you take the SATs uh, to get into uh, the colleges. It was also, uh, your admission was based on a combination of test scores and high school average. And in general, in the 60s, you needed a high school average of at least 85% to get into the senior colleges and over 77% to get into the community colleges. The community colleges in their early years were serving a population not very different from the senior colleges. Uh, that, that, that change in population is something that came much later. CUNY simply didn't have room for all who wanted to come. Uh, and in the 60s, the early 60s, there were many observers who already thought that admissions were too high for the city university, uh, way before open admissions came into play. It's important to remember that City University didn't exist as a consolidated uh, university unit until 1961, a very young university in terms of the formal uh, designation. And just three years, uh, three, uh, yeah, just three years after uh, the, the formal consolidation of the university, New York City faced what was the biggest influx of high school graduates uh, that historically had been seen in the city. Um, and the demographics of the city were changing. Uh, many of these high school graduates were black and Puerto Rican at that time, that being the uh, predominant uh, Hispanic population. The university had already said in its master plan of several years running that its goal was to admit 50% of all the high school graduates in New York City. That was the university goal that they were aiming toward. There was a natural pressure with uh, folks coming out of high school to want to go on to higher ed. And the question was, where were they going to go? Uh, many of them could not afford the private universities. All kinds of stopgap measures were put in place. Uh, in the 64 year, the university managed to squeeze in an extra 3,000 students by extending days, giving lectures, using closed circuit TV, a whole variety of very creative kinds of things um, to meet the demand that was out there and that was growing and growing and growing. <laughs> By that time, uh, Chancellor Bowker was at the university, and many of you in the room uh, had the opportunity to work very, very closely with him. And as he saw what was happening and the pressures that were growing on the university, and the fact that the university uh, proportion of minorities had stayed the same at 5% since 1950, and that was still at 5% at that time, he was very conscious of the need to try to do something. Uh, and in those years, the mid-years, uh, uh, 64 and then 66, we saw the development of the College Discovery Program and the SEEK Program with state funding uh, through the vigorous efforts of Chancellor Bowker and many of the help, I'm sure, of people right here in this room as the major way to get around the fact that so few minorities were getting access to the university and that basically the city was beginning to look different in terms of who was graduating from high school and, and their desire to go on for higher education. Uh, college discovery at the community colleges was based on, on income, uh, low income. SEEK was based on geography. Uh, you had to live in a particular part of the city and that was the way to get at admitting more minorities since this, we were a pretty residentially segregated city. Uh, the CUNY Master Plan in 1966 set a goal of serving 100% of the high school graduates of the city of New York by the year 1975. And the plan that was in place for doing that, in terms of how that would happen, uh, in, besides building more facilities and adding more colleges, was to allocate the top 25% of that group to the senior colleges, to allow the next 40% to go to the community colleges, to use CD uh, to serve the next 10%, and then to set up some educational opportunity centers, uh, which didn't exist at that time, uh, as a way to prepare the remainder of the group who might not meet those criteria. In the 60s, we were, many of us were 
engaged in many, op in many efforts to increase equal opportunity. Uh, there was civil disobedience across the country. We saw in the 60s the assassination of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, Robert Kennedy. There were student demonstrations, I don't have to tell you, on all kinds of subjects, uh, including a very uh, prominent one at Columbia University. And it really was in the context of this cauldron of social change and, and this growing demand for access to equal opportunity that what we think of as the open admissions policy at City University developed. The Chancellor was moving ahead with plans to build more community colleges, to build more uh, senior colleges, uh, a, a construction fund uh, was put in place, but still there was not sufficient resources to meet the demand which was growing and growing and growing. The special programs were there, but they, there was no way that they could manage the demand that was growing. So the dilemma was how to open the university to more non-white students without tracking, number one, and two, not at the expense of others. Um, this was a very tense and lively period of time in the history of New York City and the history of the City University. Um, there were many proposals, there were many hot feelings. Uh, it, this had come in the wake of school decentralization in the public schools, of a pro also in the wake of a protracted teacher strike which had polarized the city. An unexpected kind of coalition began to emerge for open admissions at, in higher education at the CUNY level, and that coalition included the UFT, and it included the Central Labor Council. And the Central Labor Council, in my opinion, was a very, very important part of, of how this happened. The Central Labor Council at that time represented essentially the working class white ethnics of New York City. Um, the Irish Americans and Italian Americans and Catholics. Um, and their children also were experiencing this desire to go on to higher education, as everyone else was. And in many cases, it was believed, whether it was true or not, that they didn't have the GPAs to compete in the regular admissions pool and didn't live in the neighborhoods to get in through the, uh, you know, through the special programs that have been put in place. So only a fully open admissions as contrasted to the many different proposals that were floated at that time could really accommodate this group in addition to all of the other pressures that were going on in the city. Um, the increasing demand had been documented in lots of reports over many years, the Strayer Report, the Strayer-Yavner Report, the Heald Report, which became uh, the, the blueprints of SUNY. Um, but the city college system was real slow to move and was not getting support in moving on this. In fact, admissions had been going down in the university from 1952 to 1961, uh, and that minority figure stayed at 5%. Uh, after the Heald report, the situation between the state and the city polarized a great deal, and, and the, the question of free tuition became the major access uh, strategy, uh, keeping free tuition became the major access strategy uh, for the city and for the city university, while the state somewhat disingenuously began to uh, argue that indeed it was free tuition that was keeping blacks and Puerto Ricans out of the university uh, because of it keeping the numbers down. The policy that was ultimately passed moved the target date for what had been a vague concept in the master plan up five years, implementing in 1970 what was to happen, but had been only a vague concept, what was originally to happen in 1975. And the phrasing of the policy really reflected the widely diverse groups which participated in that political decision. Uh, it was to accomplish several things. It would, one, offer admissions to some university program, to, uh, to all high school graduates of the city, to provide for remedial and other supportive services to any student requiring them. Three, maintain and enhance the standards of the university. Four, result in the ethnic integration of the colleges. This is straight from the resolution. Five, provide for mobility of students between the different units of the university. And six, to assure that all students who had been admitted under the previous admissions requirements could be admitted at the same time in the year of implementation of open admissions. Words which clearly bespeak the desire to meet the demands of aspiring communities without taking something away from other people. A hard compromise in a city like New York 
in, in a, in, especially in times of budget constraints. Um, in the way this was implemented, those who came in under open admissions were to have high school averages of 80% or higher. Uh, th those who had high school averages of 80% or higher uh, or who were in the top half of their class uh, could go to the senior colleges, others would go to the community colleges. And transfer between the community colleges, automatic transfer with credits was affirmed because that mobility was considered to be important. Seek was to be expanded. Uh, and this was clearly happening in a time of crisis, in a time of great pressure. Uh, it brought into existence uh, a system which was almost in some ways the reverse of the California system uh, in which the majority of the students were in the community colleges. Here the goal was to get folks into the senior colleges and the, the 1970s policy actually achieved that. Uh, it eroded later. Um, the Central Labor Council was right, actually. Harry Van Arsdale was onto something. Of the 35,000 or so students who were admitted in the first two years of open admissions, uh, approximately uh, 26,000 were white and 8,000 were minority. The, of, of course, minorities uh, ended up in greater proportion. Numerically, more were white. Proportionately, in terms of how low their numbers had been in the system, uh, the, the influx of minorities was very, very visible. The program continued, and continues I guess, to be perceived as a minority program, even though everything about the numbers tells us quite the opposite, and that's obviously a very important political fact here in New York City. Um, the, the goal was to begin to create access, to provide support services, to begin to close the educational gap that existed between ethnic groups in the city. Uh, a very, very ambitious uh, kind of agenda. One of the things it did accomplish, uh, besides the, uh, the good outcomes for individuals, which many people in the room, including David Lapp, and can speak to very, uh, in gr very great detail, was to increase the college going rate in New York City and to respond to a demand which had been bottled up for a long, long time. Open admissions, as I've just described, came to an end in the City University in 1976 uh, when the city, in one of its more extreme fiscal crises, uh, which you may recall uh, when the city, in essence, was almost put in receivership, uh, as a trade-off for state funding uh, for the City University senior colleges, uh, gave up free tuition. Now, TAP had been in place, so and SUNY had had uh, tuition already. So the upstate, downstate forces had a great deal to contrast in terms of uh, both values and how education was being carried out. After after the end of free tuition uh, and the uh, and the state funding of the senior colleges, admissions criteria in the city university changed. And I'm always very much surprised as to how much denial there is about this in the general populace. Um, after 1976. Uh, more stringent requirements for admissions were put in place. Skills proficiency tests for access to upper division work were put in place. Uh, and this all came at a time of cutbacks because it was a fiscal crisis underway, uh, which made it hard to implement the supports. In that first post-open admissions class, there were 11,000 freshmen less than there had been in the, uh, in the last open admissions class. And and even today, perhaps because the students of CUNY are poor and more diverse, um, it continues to be perceived as an open admissions institution, which I think is an interesting fact. Now, remediation has taken center stage in the current debate around CUNY. Um, as we all know, the CUNY board passed a resolution uh, to phase out remedial instruction in all baccalaureate programs by 2001. Um, the published estimates tell us, although there's debate about them, that this will affect about 50% of entering freshmen, with about two-thirds being black, Hispanic, or Asian, with a lot of variation from college. The, the policy, as you all undoubtedly know, uh, is in limbo since an injunction based on the open meeting law 
uh, has uh, been filed, and the regions have also taken the stand that this requires uh, regions to prove it. Now, remediation has become the focus because it's seen as expensive, or at least it can be talked about as expensive as being a drain on resources, but it's clearly not a, na uh, not a CUNY issue, it's clearly a national issue, as I'm sure we'll hear from our other two speakers. Um, all, the, all the research figures and statistics tell us that about 75% or 78%, I guess it is, of institutions that have freshmen offer some remediation, that over 80% of all public four-year colleges offer remediation, and, and by and large, even selective institutions, although they may not call it that, offer courses which are, in essence, remediation. So this is not a problem that CUNY invented. It's not a problem that CUNY alone has to struggle with. Nationally, we're seeing the discussion shift to academic standards again, and this is a discussion which has always come about whenever a new group has entered into a system or whenever the system is dealing with scarce resources. Um, and I think the reason I read the, the quote from the Sherry Gorlick book is because it's such a dramatic example of how this was supply and demand linked uh, as opposed to being educationally decided over the years. Uh, and that's a real pause for us to think in terms of policy. Um, focusing on remediation begs the question in terms of what we want to do in terms of public education policy in New York State. It begs the question that we are 41st per capita and how much we spend on higher ed. Uh, and it begs the question that CUNY and the independent sector both serve more minority students than the SUNY sector does. Um, looking back on the history of SUNY, I'm struck that uh, beginning in a time where there were no high schools in New York City and coming up to the present, uh, the system and many higher education systems now are sort of serving a safety valve function uh, for high schools, uh, for systems that have had 12 years to work on certain things. A system like CUNY is now forced to try to work in two semesters on issues of, of what have become remediation at the higher level. Um, New Yorkers are constantly reminded that we're not America, but in this case, uh, we are America. Um, the issues that apply to CUNY really do apply to higher education across the country, although they show themselves differently here. Um, higher ed, as I'm sure we'll hear from Pat, is changing dramatically in many, many ways, uh, and we're going to have to find some way to deal with that. The basic issue is that we've long ago crossed the bridge in terms of access to higher ed. Higher ed is the American dream for everyone, and that's not going to go away. Uh, and no matter what we do in terms of setting criteria, that's not going to go away. We've been successful in higher ed in creating uh, the baccalaureate as a passport to economic stability. And that complicates this policy discussion ever more in terms of what we need to do. So if I were to end quickly, and I'm sorry to have taken too much time, I would say that New York State and New York City is sorely in need of some more long-range thinking on what we want higher education to be, both in the public and private sector here in the state, who we want to serve, and how, what strategies we're going to do, uh, put in place to make sure that happens. Um, we could allow battles to be fought on a one-to-one -one basis the skirmishes, we'll win some, we'll lose some, but that really is not going to solve the long-range rising demand for higher education as a way uh, into the broader society. And I'll just stop there and we'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you very much, Dean Marcus, for your introduction. It's good to be back in New York after 10 years. I'm now Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts at Boston, which is sometimes called the CUNY of Boston or the City University of Boston. But one big difference is we're the only public university in the city surrounded by some 50 private institutions. So there's a little bit of difference there. It's my thesis today that we should open wider the gates of American colleges and universities. The college experience should be open to anyone who can successfully benefit from college and complete a degree. I say this as president of a successful major public university and as a citizen of the world's most productive nation when it comes to educating and graduating students. I'm going to talk about what we do as an example that may give some insights of ways this policy discussion could go forward and maybe some things that might look at the future. I'll look at the reasons for the need to expand and deepen the pool of those eligible for college and then I'll discuss our obligation. We must ensure their preparation before enrolling 
and then we must provide an ongoing program of support so that they complete their undergraduate degrees. Why do we need to do this? Simple demographic data is very clear, as is the need for a more highly educated workforce. Close to home, I note the changing nature of New England's population has profound implications for the educational institutions in New England, especially in Massachusetts. We have only two things in Massachusetts, cranberries and brain power. So we really have to work on the brain power because we don't have any other natural resources. In Massachusetts and New England, by 2010, minorities will account for one-third of new workforce entrants, up from 13% just in 1984. Similar rises in minority representation in the workforce will be characteristic of other urban areas. We are not alone there. At the same time, we know that in New England, and especially in Massachusetts, demand for workers with graduate and professional degrees will grow by 70%. Corresponding requirements will happen here, also in New York. Education, we know, is a primary determinant of economic well-being, and no economy will prosper long unless its workforce is prepared for the shifting demands of the workplace. Our knowledge-intensive economy here in New York, as well as in New England, requires this very well-trained workforce, especially in skills in communication, computer, quantitative skills. The in industries that we are worried about supplying are finance, insurance, and quantitative areas in software engineering. We know this from the statistics that have been done by a group at UMass Amherst called MISER, the Institute for Social and Economic Policy Analysis. So it would be short-sighted of us not to pay attention to what we already know. We also know that in New England, 80% of the new job openings will require at least a post-secondary degree. So you combine that 80% with my early 70% of need for professional and more beyond a baccalaureate, and you can see the urgency of having more students get graduate from both high school and college. I believe that higher education bears a special responsibility here to develop the skill levels and the expertise of undergraduate and graduate students to fill these more specialized positions which will make up our economy. We are fortunate in the United States that historically the trend has been for us to open our doors wider in higher education. If we look back at the GI Bills of the 40s and Title IX, we can thank John Bradamus for Title IX, brought two large new populations onto our campuses. The Higher Education Act of 1965 established that the federal government would be a major provider of financial aid. And believe me when I say adequate financial aid is crucial to most of our students. We know that many of them drop out for financial, not academic reasons. The recent higher education reauthorization, which will increase Pell Grants, will be a real boost to my institution and to yours also, as will lowering the interest rates on loans. These actions will allow many more individuals to go to college. Along with the GI Bill and Title IX, we had a lot of affirmative action plans to increase the populations of minorities who could also go to college. This age of increased access, which lasted about 30 years, paralleled, as Gussie has said, the civil rights movement and the women's movement. And I believe our society is much richer today for having the services and skills of these more highly educated citizens who gained entrance to college because of enhanced opportunities. This must continue. So in addition to financial aid, what else must we do to make sure that these students are not simply admitted, but that they graduate? We have had some programs in place in Massachusetts which are successful, and I'd like to mention a few of these to you. We try to look at students who are at risk, but we bring them into higher education with the goal of having them succeed. Again, it is our obligation to not only admit them, but to make sure that they succeed. There is a wonderful article in the College Board magazine this summer by Lawrence Gladue and William Swale that articulates this central issue in very pragmatic terms. If you haven't read it, I suggest that you do. They say the majority haves are much more successful than the minority have-nots in applying and being accepted to colleges and universities. So in addition to advocating national school reform and rising expectations of what students should achieve, the authors also call for direct outreach to more of the current generation. Intervention, they say, 
intervention programs to make a difference in the lives of young disadvantaged children. Better prepared students will gain access to higher education more easily, and intervention programs are necessary, and I believe they're a special obligation of public universities. We have several of these at UMass Boston, and I'd like to mention two or three with something about what has worked and give you some data on that. Our most successful program is the Urban Scholars Program, which began in 1983. We take 30 middle and high school students from the Boston Public Schools, largely minority since the Boston Public Schools are about 90% minority. They receive after school work and summer work for all this period of time in junior high and high school. Because they would come from low income and working class families, they earn a stipend of $50 a week during the school year and $800 for the summer. This stipend lets learning become their full-time job because if they weren't with us, they would have to hold some kind of a job to contribute to their family income. About 200 students have gone through this program so far. Today, 100% have been accepted at a four-year college or university. 96 of those have actually matriculated, and 87% have either graduated already or are still in college. By contrast, less than 11% of Boston Public School graduates and less than 3% of the minorities obtain a baccalaureate degree. The motto of this program is that we, it can ill afford not to develop the potential of our most talented youth. This one was so successful, we put in place a second program with the three high schools that are geographically closest to the campus. This is called guaranteed admissions. They're required to take a college prep course, they're required to get a 2.5 average, and we offer extensive tutoring to them by our own undergraduate students. We also bring them on campus once or twice a year with their parents to learn about going to college. We have a developmental skills course that we offer for them and other students who are thinking about college. If I look just back at last year, what happened with this group, we had 80 seniors in the program in these three high schools. 50 applied to UMass Boston, 37 were accepted, and 32 enrolled. Now, we don't see it as a failure if those other ones went to some other university in the Boston area, and many of them did. But because they're familiar with our campus, many of them come. Another piece of good news here is that one of these schools, Dorchester High School, was about to lose its accreditation and appeared to be having a very difficult time. My alumnus of 1993, one Pamela Treffler, came forward with a million dollar grant to UMass Boston to help us make Dorchester High School into a model urban high school. We are going to start doing that this year by turning it into learning communities. And at this particular high school, guaranteed admissions will have a very special meaning because we'll have much of the economic support that we need to make it successful. Gets better after that gift, she came back with another $600,000 gift for us to work with high-risk students at English High School because these program, programs do cost money. I'd like to mention just two others. We also have a talented and gifted Hispanic program called TAG where we again work with seven Boston schools, enrolling 250 students during the year and about 150 during the summer. Again, in tutorial programs, intensive coursework. Again, these students visit the campus, and we've had very good success rates also with them coming on to college. To feed the TAG program, which is a high school program, we have something called Alert, which works with third, fourth, and fifth graders. Hispanic students to encourage them to go on to college. The Hispanic population is growing in Boston and it is one we have not been as successful with as we would like in terms of college entrance. In the summer, we have another program that I'll mention called Directions for Student Potential. We've offered this for 20 years. It's a free six-week program in the summer focusing on English, math, and critical thinking skills. Students who cannot be admitted to UMass Boston because they don't have the academic records, who take this program and are successful, are automatically admitted to our university. We've had that program going for 20 years, and between 150 and 300 students participate each summer. This year, about 97% of them were admitted to our college after the successful summer program. When they are then in campus, we continue working with them through special tutoring and other kinds of programs. 
The results of these incentive programs speak for themselves. We are an urban university of 12,500 students with a population that is reflective of the city of Boston. Our students work and they live in the city, but these programs that we have put in place are benefiting the city and the university together. Our freshman class this year is 42% minority. The minority population of Boston is 44%. 30% of our overall student body is minority and then I need to brag about three PhD programs. When we began to have PhD programs at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, there was some conflict with our sister institution, UMass Amherst, as to why the little kid on the block should have PhD programs. And we said one of the things we wanted to do was increase the pool of people in PhD programs. Three of our PhD programs have 30% of the students minority, which is quite unusual on the national level. Clinical psychology, our education programs, and public policy. Programs which help students prepare for college, as well as programs that support them during their college years, are the keys to success and graduation. I would hasten to agree with the authors of the College Board Magazine article that financial aid is necessary, but not enough. It isn't sufficient. We must promote access, and we must see that larger numbers of students are successful in college and graduate. True equal opportunity and real access means successful completion of that goal. Because of the debate that is in New York at this time, some of you may wonder why we need all these attractive and supportive programs. Why not just admit those who are fully qualified and motiv motivated for college and allow them to pursue college? Take along a few high-risk students at the same time. I don't believe that that approach is the best one for my city for my state or for the nation. In the United States, we will benefit if more rather than fewer people gain the tangible and intangible benefits of a college degree. We will also benefit when our college classes are more diverse, if all ages, races, ethnic groups are represented, and we will gain much from wider first-hand experiences with a broader range of ideas, attitudes, and beliefs. A recent poll on diversity in higher education looking at the Massachusetts residents shows the citizens of our state agree. The poll conducted by the Ford Foundation's Campus Diversity Initiative indicated that 74% of the respondents think that diversity programs on college campuses help bring society together. Nine out of 10 agreed that in the next generation, people will need to get along with people who are not like them. I would add that at UMass Boston, we think that the student's experience should mirror the world around the student. The genuine challenge as public colleges and universities is to successfully graduate students who come from these many backgrounds, lower socioeconomic status, and who are public, not private high school graduates. Many come from single parent families, many are the head of the family themselves, 90% of them work while they go to college. Thus, they may come to our college gates with one type of deficit, but they also come with an incredible list of positives. In an era of increasing income inequality, strengthening and broadening educational opportunity is key, not only to economic growth, but to narrowing the gap between the leaders and the led, the entitled and the underprivileged, the free to make choices, and those condemned to live without any choices at all. We need together, as a public policy debate, find ways to get larger numbers of students into and through college. My thesis, again, is that I believe in excellence, in equal opportunity, but that we must provide students with the support they need to succeed. What would happen, for example, if we spent significant amount of money on our least advantaged students? rather than on the most advantaged one. I taught at Yale for some six years, so I'll say that again. What would happen if we spent significant amounts of money on the least advantaged students rather than on the most advantaged ones? We need to make informed, shrewd choices about how we are allocating our state and national resources. That's the crucial criterion of our success or our failures as educators and leaders. It was true a century ago, and it will be just as true in the new millennium. 
It's incumbent upon us to formulate sound public policy based upon making better use of our financial and human resources at our disposal. In the long run, such an investment will bring full advantage to all of us and we'll all reap the benefits of them in our shining potential of those students. Thank you very much. Marcus for the invitation to be here today and to share this podium with uh, with two educators whose work I uh, admire so much and have learned so much from. Our, our job is to try to start a conversation and I'm going to try to do this in a way so there really uh, 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 is a conversation by uh, be, by trying to put some ideas on the table and then responding to some things, whatever, whatever among those you may uh, like to talk about. Let me say first of all that I um, I'm here today as president of a national policy center that deals with the public policy side of higher education, state and federal policy, with <laughs> issues like who should go, what is the appropriate nature of public accountability, how should we finance and, and govern higher education. And I think, uh, so I come here no, into this room no, uh, for sure knowing less about uh, CUNY and New York than almost anyone else. So we have done studies here in our publications such as Crosstalk, which I think some of you see, uh, do occasionally uh, cover issues in New York as we have uh, the, remedial, uh, uh, the, the remedial debate that's uh, uh, that's, that has gone on here, but I'm not uh, presumptuous enough to come here as someone who has answers, but rather to try to uh, provide some context, which I hope might be helpful to you. Uh, first of all, and from a, from a I guess, suppose a subjective uh, point of view of someone who looks at a lot of states and a lot of institutions. Um, first, I think the uh, it is kind of interesting since I have, up until I started this center, spent most of the last five years focusing primarily on higher education in California, that in a way, California and New York represent over the past 30 years the most striking and dramatic examples of what the country was trying to do in broadening uh, the accessibility uh, of higher education and the participation of Americans in it. Uh, California with its 1960 master plan for higher education which became the first state anywhere in the country to say that any Californian who could benefit uh, could have a place somewhere in the higher education system and then you heard uh, uh, the, uh, uh, several years later, the uh, description of how uh, uh, New York moved to address the same, uh, the same, the same issues. I think we're involved, uh, although as I mentioned to those of you we had di dinner with last night, uh, we're involved in a very, very high stakes set of questions uh, in which uh, some of the uh, conventions, if you want, of the past 50 years, uh, for better or for worse, are, are unraveling about higher education, how it should operate, and its role in American society. And issues like the remedial question here are huge pieces of that. Uh, and one of the interesting things is, uh, talking to so many of you who are involved in different kinds of studies, as I have uh, talked to people around the country who are doing this, is uh, everyone has, uh, an awful lot of people have hands on different pieces of this. What I want to suggest is that a lot of the conventions that we built about higher education, a lot of the social contracts with those of us in it and between higher education and society in the post-World War II period are now kind of up for question uh, uh, for, the first, uh, for the first time. And no, uh, and, and I think first and foremost among those are uh, a set of issues that we really began to, uh, that the, the country settled on uh, in the, with the GI Bill and in the wake of the GI Bill about who we would serve. And this decision that we made in a country that uh, before World War II, less than half of the uh, population graduated from high school uh, to, uh, uh, to open the system, uh, to the GIs and over the opposition of the leaders of American higher education. I was quoting Robert Hutchins last night who warned the country that, uh, that the GIs were intellectual hobos who would turn our college campuses into intellectual hobo jungles. And what they in fact did was change our idea very drastically of who could benefit from higher education. That it was not just young people uh, just out of high school. And then of course when their kids came along in the late 50s and early 60s and into the 70s, uh, we made 
uh, this uh, commitment to not, not just to let the same portion of that generation have opportunity for college, but rather to uh, broaden participation at the same time, just dealing with those huge numbers at the same rates of participation would have been an incredible challenge. Now, I think it's important to point out that in, er in this and in everything else, the things we uh, tried to do as a result of the civil rights movement, some of the things that were discussed about the participation of women in higher education, uh, with this, as with almost everything else the country has done, I think, in the second half of the 20th century about higher education, a good part of it was a leap of faith. Uh, nobody knew that the GI Bill, that all those GIs would find good jobs, that would create this fuel, help fuel this incredible expansion of the American middle class, that would produce another generation with, with even higher aspirations uh, for higher education. And nobody knew when those young people, baby boomers, were coming along, uh, that there would be a job for every one of those uh, who graduated, or that they would do uh, as well as they have done. So there's a part of this that uh, historically we can demonstrate with a good investment, but a lot of it was a set of values in this country about the development of human talent uh, that really drove all of this, and a belief that it was good for individuals to do that, and that it was good for society um, uh, as a whole. And now it seems to be uh, periodically, uh, and not always for uh, uh, not always for inappropriate reasons, uh, issues get raised about that commitment and about the appropriateness of that commitment. And we're in a period like that right now. And the, to understand that that's really what this debate is about is not to imply that any particular answer as to who ought to do what or how it ought to be done uh, is correct. But we're in a big discussion. It's taking place in California. It's taking place all over the uh, New York. It's taking place all over the country. It's especially taking place in, uh, in, the, in, the, in many of the 23 states or so that are going to see about a, at least a 20% increase in high school graduations over the next um, decade. So that's raising the question again at a time when the public sector I doesn't expect to have the resources that it had uh, when we had the, the last great tidal wave of students, which was the baby boomers. So this question is, it, it, we will do a lot better in this debate, even as we argue about the specific programs and the specific pieces, if we understand what it is we're really, uh, uh, what it is that is underlying all that. But, uh, but this comes at us at a time when not much else is particularly stable either. Again, when, the, when I talk about the conventions having broken down, I mean, with respect to the broad access and participation of higher education, I think we're now in a position after many experiments, uh, many of the, uh, hard lessons we've learned, some have resulted in enormous creativity, the kinds of programs that Sherry was just talking about come out of uh, things we've really learned about how to uh, develop the, uh, the skills and knowledge and make it possible for people to uh, succeed. But we also uh, see, and sometimes have, uh, uh, those of us who have helped to push this movement have not been as forthright about some of the flaws. Uh, my friend and colleague who's here today, Josh Smith, uh, had the uncomfortable job during some of the time he was chancellor of the community colleges in California of telling them that they had take, they'd become too smug about their commitment to access and they needed to be working on uh, the value added side more, not at the expense of access, but that uh, quality means uh, the power of uh, this uh, experience in people's lives, not just who we let in the door. And that wasn't a lesson everyone out there particularly wanted to hear at the time. Uh, at the same time, it seems to me there are a set of other issues that whatever broad, loose national consensus about how to pay for higher education we might have had 25 years ago or so anyway, uh, has also pretty much dissipated. And I agree with the, uh, with the, 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 the statement in the, uh, the report by uh, the, the uh, Comptroller's report that was issued here that talks about, it could be true of New York and the majority of states that I know, that talks about how a, a set of higher education, uh, a kind of restructuring of the higher education finance system, reallocation of responsibilities among institutions, government, families, uh, 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 banks, uh, etc., has taken place uh, without much explicit public debate. And at the federal level, that's led to a really undebated and undiscussed uh, movement to where uh, student debt is a major part of the national financial aid system. Maybe it's good or maybe it's bad, but we've never had that conversation. Uh, and, uh, and at the state level, uh, it has led to uh, often to either underfunding or to pushing uh, uh, again, not so much in response to policy-driven sense of what the share that students ought to pay, and, uh, but, 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 uh, but simply an expedient way of pushing 
uh, costs along to students. And the, uh, whatever the strengths of the, la of the latest, uh, uh, Sherry talked about the positive things the federal government has done, and I agree, but the weaknesses of what the federal government has done in terms of the huge tax credit program is that they, that they enacted, uh, which is where most of the new federal money in higher education is going, is that it provides an incredible opportunity for states, if they wish to, uh, to reduce their support for higher education, uh, to raise tuition, let the families collect the tax credits, spend the money on tax relief or prisons or um, reducing automobile fees. And that, that, that danger will not be tested until the next recession because historically for the last 25 years the states have been doing that without this federal incentive every time the economy uh, goes down. And of course uh, that will happen uh, at the expense uh, uh, primarily of the lowest, uh, lowest income students. So we need uh, a, a new sort of consensus, a new set of ground rules so that we can tell, we can assure the families and the young people in our states and our cities uh, that uh, this is how the system will work for them, that if they take a tough high school curriculum, if they take the summer programs, if that's what they need, that when they get there, there will be a space for them and they'll be able to pay for it and it won't be just be the capriciousness uh, of the political environment that they're in. Also, uh, we've just completed, uh, 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 my colleagues and I, a major look at governance of higher education in uh, eight major states, in including New York. We, the research was done in the early 1990s and we, oh, I come out of that with a sense that um, it's very possible that uh, two or three, again, of the major sort of ideas that have driven uh, at least state level governance in higher education, and I think it goes below that to the system and institutional level in some way, uh, have somehow come unraveled and we're gonna have to find ways to renegotiate that set of social contracts. One of them has to do with the uh, the role of lay uh, trustees vis-a-vis uh, -vis professionals, and it's, a, it's an appropriate subject to discuss, and we need to be having better conversations about that rather than the kind of, uh, of trench warfare that's going on in many places, but it seems to me many of the issues about what is appropriate and uh, what should uh, professional educators do, what, uh, what should boards do, what is policy, as we used to say, and what is administration, those issues are very much in flux now, and we need to have conversations uh, uh, that have to resolve that. Uh, the concern about um, the intrusion of partisan politics, which I think is a separate concern, because one could argue for a different dividing of the responsibilities between lay and professional and still be concerned about the way, for instance, in California, however one feels about affirmative action, the inappropriateness of that issue being raised as a policy issue in the state as part of the governor's effort to run for president, to launch a presidential campaign. I think most people on both sides of the affirmative action issue uh, uh, in California would say that that was um, not helpful. And third, whether these uh, the major, uh, the, uh, we talked uh, uh, talk about the, the, the CUNY system coming to being formed in 1961, and it was in the 50s and 60s that most of these, what we call the mega systems in uh, the California State Universities, the SUNYs, the CUNYs, et cetera, were, were put together. Part of what they were supposed to do, we thought, was provide a buffer against partisan political influence. Uh, 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 not the appropriate ways in which the public and politicians uh, should be able to weigh in on higher education, but the most partisan approaches. And it's, it seems to me as one looks around the country, one can make at least as strong a case that those organizational mechanisms have become conduits rather than buffers for inappropriate political interference. And maybe these mechanisms are, uh, as well as they might have served us in the past, uh, need to be somewhat reconsidered. I once worked as a vice president for a few years at the Education Commission of the States, and we used to always be asked to come out and testify on these bills that governors and legislators were put in. And usually if they saw the system was in trouble, they would argue for more centralization. Uh, a czar is usually uh, the appropriate uh, uh, initial, uh, the instinctive response at least. And we used to call it the one number to call syndrome. Uh, <laughs> that uh, there was a sense that the more you centralize this, the more you can control it externally. And so I think we don't, I'm not saying that the systems are necessarily obsolete, but I'm saying those are going to, we have to, we have to re, we're going to have to relook at those questions too. So I think the, 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 the difficulty that we, uh, uh, that we have and, both, and the opportunity we have is that all of these things seem to be up for grabs at the same time. Uh, that we, it's unlikely uh, when we follow our set, when we try to deal with a certain one piece of this, whether it's the governance or the finance or the students or the accountability, we run into the whole thing. And then if we push it far enough, we run also in, I think, to some of the larger 
political pathologies that the country as a whole and many of the states face, such as an excess of partisanship uh, in many cases that's kind of come down to the state level in a very powerful way that in most states it didn't used to, um, it didn't used to exist before. So um, it seems to me that we have kind of macro issues uh, that are, we're going to have to learn about and, and resolve in very local and incremental situations. There's not going to be a national commission that's going to tell us how to do this. Some things at the national level may help, but the, the decisions that are going to shape the future of higher education in the 21st century are going to be made in New York City, in New York State, in, in Sacramento. Uh, they're going to be, the states are, I think, going to be the heaviest uh, players and the cities and then the, the institutional leadership that we have. So the issues are huge, they're national. It sounds kind of funny in an era of where we're calling for more cosmopolitanism, more recognition of global uh, forces, etc., to be making a statement. That, but the, yeah, but, but the real question of the character of the system, uh, who it's going to serve, whether it's going to play the role that uh, uh, the country needs for higher education to play, uh, in the 21st century is really going to be decided uh, more uh, locally. I'd like to close with just a couple other things that we can pick up or not pick up uh, as you choose in the, in the discussion period. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I do believe that it'll be the state, the primary policy actor uh, will be the states. And I think what, uh, as, 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 uh, as this, um, as this issue uh, evolves. Uh, the second uh, point that we can never forget, and it was alluded to, I think, in, uh, directly and indirectly by both of the previous speakers, is uh, what has changed most fundamentally for the people of the country? What has changed most fundamentally for the people of the country? What has never existed in the history of our society or any other industrialized or any other kind of society in the past that exists now is that higher education dominates the gate to the middle class that without some education or training beyond high school, you can't get into the queue uh, for a job that will give you a middle class opportunity in American society today. That's an entirely different situation than it existed in the past. And part of it is because of, it's the economy, stupid, right? It's because of all the changes in the economy that wiped out the jobs that let people be in the middle class with high school and less. Not everyone with a college degree or with, with education or training beyond college has done well in the last 25 years. Uh, some of them did not. But almost everyone who had high school or less had somewhere between a 20 to a 40 percent decline in family income. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the people of the country get this. We have been doing public opinion polling on this throughout the 1990s in California and throughout the country. Uh, how exactly we should deal with the educational needs uh, of the students that we have right now is an open question. Uh, but the genie that we opened with the GI Bill is not going to be put back in the bottle. And the people who have tested that hypothesis is kind of interesting. Several of them are running for re-election this year and you, they, uh, somehow they don't seem to be boasting very much of the tuition increases or the downsizing of the higher education system or the cuts in financial aid program uh, because I think the polls are very clear. The country is not going to put up with this. In California, when the political and educational leadership of the state agreed to solve our financial problems in higher education by cutting enrollments by 200,000 students, 10 percent, when we were at 10 percent unemployment, it was the, pu it was a, it was the public that weighed in against that and far before the economy started coming back. Uh, the pressure to find uh, uh, ways to accommodate these students uh, return. And then finally, I think if there is one major change we're going to be looking at uh, as, we, and, and, and as we think about, the, uh, uh, about uh, uh, what lies ahead, uh, it's going to be that we're going to have to think more about, less about higher education in a vacuum and more about higher education and its role and its overall role with the public schools in developing the talent and skills of Americans. I mean, in a sense, we have a crisis, uh, a crisis that, of, of, uh, that, that extends through all ages, including the, the third to half of the students who don't come to us, especially in urban settings, directly out of high school. That is, the knowledge and skills that Americans need to function uh, in the world as it has changed so rapidly uh, uh, that we are not at the level that we need to be yet. Uh, we in higher education, I think, have been much more comfortable with things like raising admissions uh, standards than, uh, than the hard kind of roll up your sleeves work that Sherry has been talking about this morning. A teacher education is a low status, underfunded activity at most colleges and universities. And yet it seems to me if you were to say, what is one thing that higher education could do 
to address the most pressing social problems in the country. It's that, and I think we ought, it is not that there are not, there are people here today who represent some of the best work that's being done in the country, but as a whole, uh, this is not something I don't think we can show uh, much pride in. Uh, 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 I think we have failed to identify ourselves. We've been content with requiring, as our way of giving signals to the high schools about improvement, requiring uh, more Carnegie units and identifying the courses that people had to take. And we have been very reluctant to join with those who have been developing content and, and performance-based standards uh, and giving schools clear sense of not just what needs to be on the transcript, but what the students need to know uh, and be able to do. So I think it is both an advantage uh, and a, an opportunity and, uh, a, uh, and a challenge that we, are, uh, that we are living in a time when more of the big questions about higher education and the role it should play in the country are up for grabs now uh, than have ever been up for a long time. But it does make it a very high, it makes it very high stakes what happens here in this city and what happens in other places in a very, uh, in a very real way, I think that we, we have to ask ourselves, we have to ask our leaders to be more, to, 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 to carry on conversations about what are our public purposes? Why are we in this business of supporting not just public institutions, but students and private institutions as well? What is the litmus test against which we would judge the success of that investment? Uh, is it, as Sherry uh, suggested somewhat radically, how well we do with the students who are destined to succeed no matter what we do? Or ought part of the litmus test of success have something to do uh, with the impact we make on um, opportunity uh, for those who otherwise would not have it? Uh, about a, about a, uh, three years ago, we did a national poll on higher education that showed the deep concerns Americans have about access and affordability. And I asked one of my, uh, the people I have admired most in American politics, Tom Kane, who was governor of New Jersey and is now president of Drew, to come to the press conference we were having at the National Press Club and help explain this data, help me interpret this data for the media who were there that day. And what he said, and it comes back to higher education as the gateway, he said this is not about educational policy, this interest, this commitment of Americans. Uh, this is not about a conversation among policy wonks. This is about people's concerns about what's happening to opportunity in America. This is about the question about if you work hard, if you're motivated, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you take a tough curriculum, uh, will society uh, offer you the opportunity to do something with that when you graduate uh, from school? This is about people's worries that their kids won't have the same chances that they had to succeed. And again, to close, uh, uh, with uh, uh, this bit of, uh, I think, fairly critical redundancy for us to keep in, 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 in our heads. It's that it is that th those are the stakes, and we in higher education bear a greater opportunity uh, for, uh, and better, greater burden for assuring that American society uh, lives up to that set of ideals today than we ever have in the past, because we are the gateway. Thanks for listening. Thank you, speakers. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, in just a minute, I just have one housekeeping detail, and that is um, we more people came than we expected. And as Gussie Kapner said, that it's just like a metaphor for open admissions. We open the doors, and you know we've got people uh, on the windowsills. So, uh, Lee Frizzell, could you stand, Lee? Um, if you came and we you weren't on our list or we didn't know you were coming, could you please see Lee when you leave so we can make sure we have your name and address for future mailing lists? Anyway, I'd now like to open the floor to questions. And when you uh, speak, when I call on you, could you please introduce yourself and say where you're from and then say your question. Way in the back. Yes, and speak I, with voice. I think I can project. I'm Norma Hart from, among other organizations, the Puerto Rican Educators Association of New York City. Uh, much of what has been said really has uh, assumed correctly, I think, that lower education has failed to provide what students need, particularly those students who have been underrepresented in admission to college. And I think it's wonderful that we hear about programs that should be better known in New York City and elsewhere, like those at the uh, University of Massachusetts. What I would like to know, and uh, perhaps Judge Penny in particular can help us with this, is how was UMass able to get support, including funding, to provide some of the services to lower-ed students 
to enable them to come to college, while lower ed itself doesn't seem to be able to get the funding and support to provide those services which really should be provided by it. Thank you. I, I wish there were a simple answer. It's a struggle is the answer. And, and the funding that we use, we have some of the universities' funds. The, the summer program that I talked about is about $65,000 of direct cost, not counting the space and other kinds of things. Urban Scholars is funded partly by the university, but it has heavy, heavy corporate support. The bankers, the Bell, Bell Atlantic, the corporate community, we go to them often for support for these programs. So I would say that many of these programs have a lot of outside monies. We have two or three programs that are supported by the federal government. We have a McNair program in the sciences that is a federal program. We go anywhere, everywhere, anytime, any place to get funds. And there are never enough <coughs> funds because we could do much more if we had more funds. Thank you. Uh, yes, over here. Yes, uh, my name is Ronald McGuire. I'm an attorney uh, who specializes in the representation of uh, CUNY students. Uh, and uh, my question is uh, for President Kaplan and for anyone else on the panel, but since there are so many people here who are new to CUNY, and as part of the motivation for my question, uh, I think it's important to note that CUNY is the institution of higher education with the largest number of black and Latino students in the history of this nation. And that every year, uh, CUNY grants more bachelor's, associate's, and master's degrees to black and Latino students than any other institution in this nation's history. Uh, and I think when we contrast what's happening at CUNY now with the history of the development of the municipal colleges in New York City, uh, the question of racism comes really into, the, into, the, into play. Specifically, if we look at the fact that CUNY had free tuition for 129 years, including the Great Depression, and that when uh, CUNY was, when the trustees were faced with demands to end free tuition in the 1930s, not only did they not end free tuition, but in the depths of the Great Depression, the trustees and the, politi and the politicians in New York State moved heaven and earth to open up Brooklyn College in 1930, Queens College in 1937, the uptown campus of, of uh, Hunter College, we now call Lehman College, in 1930 19, in uh, uh, also. And that this was done in the largest expansion of CUNY up until uh, open admissions, uh, when the student body was white. My question is, is what is hap can we extricate what's happening in higher education with the fact that there has been a history in this city of expanding higher education up until the point that the, that the student body became predominantly, uh, predominantly non-white? And, uh, and, and, and how do we get this into the debate? And my final point is that if we look, around, if we look at open access, open access is simply not an issue in the land-grant colleges, you know, out in the West, in Nebraska, Oklahoma, in the places where they still have open access and where the student body is well over 95 percent white. Um, Gussie, do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> hi, Ron McGuire. Hi, <laughs> right. are you? Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a strong strain of this in, um, in much of what's happening, not just in in CUNY, but in some of the other places around the United States also. I think it's not quite that simple, though. Um, when you passed from the era of the 30s, the 40s, and all that uh, into the era of the 60s, you also passed in New York State into an era where you had a SUNY system, another public system, um, which had tuition and already had in place on the state level tuition assistance programs. So it made it a lot harder to carry the day for all, all of those reasons. Um, so I don't think it simply boils down to black and white, excuse the pun, uh, in that situation. But I do think it boils down to um, the political power or lack of political power of different constituencies at different periods in time. And that one of the challenges, those of us who want to see a CUNY in the future and a CUNY that serves whatever the population is, of New York City at a given time is to figure out uh, how we can, one, have the policy discussions that Pat, are, Pat is referring to and to have those in a way which are not, however, politically naive and at the same time 
build some kinds of coalitions as the city university has always had to do and as the gentleman sitting next to you is such an expert on doing uh, to, to carry the day for access in whatever form that may take in the future. I don't think we're going to see any going back, Ron, to what it was like. I think things have changed too much and I think things are changing in higher education too much everywhere. But it, it, it does us no good to, to whatever we think the reason was. We've got to move forward from here and figure out how we build the political strategy, the policy questions, and the coalitions among whom. Uh, I, uh, I, when I mentioned about the Central Labor Council and the role that they play uh, in the formation of, of open emissions and the, you know, the deal that was struck there, that was a very critical role. And Julie Sadelstein and I have talked about this. We need to give some hard thought to what those groups are that can come together in a way that will work for this city to build that kind of public constituency for public education. And none of us have quite figured it out yet, but we need to figure that out. Uh, yes, Larry Edwards. And Larry Edwards, the uh, superintendent for the high schools in the city of New York. I'd like to um, first support the thesis that Dr. Penay had uh, talked about. The early outreach to uh, youngsters in uh, secondary education is a key to uh, the whole issue of accessing to uh, higher education. We in the city of New York have had, uh, contrary to some belief, and maybe it's the best kept secret, we have had uh, years, actually decades, of working collaboratively with the college of the city. Uh, in particular, uh, for this particular decade, uh, with our friends from the city university. Uh, there has been an entire change in the operation of the two systems in doing exactly what you are doing in Boston. I can remember as a very young guidance counselor in a high school in the 1960s, uh, being in the first wave of the college discovery program with CUNY that was at the high school level. A brand new approach, minority youngsters uh, accessing to a university before open admissions of the 70s. There is a rich, rich history of this here in this city. The problem is numerous. One is sheer number. In this city, everything is the sheer number that whatever you do will benefit some, but it may never benefit all. And it's in trying to reach the sum to the all that has been a major challenge for both secondary and higher education here in this city. And the second is sustaining something. The longer you sustain a particular problem, it becomes uh, less, I'll, I, the word that comes to mind is sexy, but it, we constantly need to change programs for the just mere factor that the name of a program that sustained for a decade while the problem still goes on from that sum to all is one of the challenges here. So we keep changing things, and rightfully so because there's an excitement in education for that change. But the problem is that in many ways we're really doing very much the same thing. And the fact of, and I noted your numbers, uh, when you reach 100, how exciting for the hundred. The challenge for us, and I guess for all in edu urban education, is how to do this at the earliest levels. And that's the struggle of my chancellor at this point and working primarily, and the beauty for me has been the working collaboratively with the city university on a daily basis, on an operational basis, not just a philosophical policy issue to get this done. So I applaud your efforts. We'd love to find out and then we can share some of those. Okay, uh, Stanley Kaplan over there. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make one comment sorry. on that because um, I, I'm, I'm so happy you raised that because um, there are those many collaborative programs in, in New York City. Um, one of the things that we may need to think about is if, we're, if systems are forced into reinventing programs because they are no longer sexy, even Funded by private money are not funded by public money, 
and very few of them are properly funded by state money. Um, if we just had the thesis that a lot of this is going to be solved uh, somewhere at the state level with state intervention, then one of the things we need to th think through is how to build those collaborative K through 12 higher ed partnerships into some state policy. Um, the only one other thing I would add is that I think while we are thinking about changes that are taking place uh, in higher ed, we should also be thinking about whether we need to think about what the function and purposes of high school are, and I just throw that out to be provocative. No other reason? <laughs> okay, Stanley Kaplan, and then we have a question. Thank you. Uh, I have here uh, a phone out from the New York, I believe it was the New York Times, testing one, two, three, put out by the uh, uh, Chancellor of the Board of Regents and the State Commission of Education. Uh, my question is, if the students will need uh, for the future, for graduation, <coughs> certain regions credits and all, will there be open access? And if, they, if you call this open access to all the graduates, then I think the need for mediation, if they pass all these uh, examinations, will sort of disappear. I'd like your thoughts on that. <laughs> Dr. Kaffner. Well, I, as, uh, as many folks probably know, we face right now a fairly big issue as to how many of the currently enrolled uh, students in education in the state are going to be able to pass the new region's criteria. Uh, and I, as a head of a college, just received something from the state education department asking me to think about safety net features for those students who are in place and who are clearly not going to be able to pass this. So, in part, I think the question is, one, do we believe that the region standard is the right standard, number one. Uh, number two, uh, have we put in place enough, uh, a, wider, a wide enough variety of ways to reach that standard for all the different kinds of learning styles and children and whatnot in our, in our public schools? Um, and to answer your, your really hard question, Stanley, I don't know if everybody could pass the regents, whether, um, whether that would make the need for remediation disappear unless the, unless the tests that a particular institution were using were pegged very specifically to the regents' tests, you might have a total unalignment of those tests and still have folks who by some standard need remediation in some aspect of what a college thinks is important for admissions to their college. Okay, um, yes, right uh, in front here. Walter Gold State, State University. Oh, could you introduce yourself? Uh, Walter Gold State. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, we are uh, all on the same side, there is no debate. We all agree on that there is this problem, we disagree about what can be done, but we're not talking about an industry procedure. Now, Mr. Callan mentioned in the state legislature in California, there was this motion to greatly constrict numbers in financing. We find the same thing in the state legislature in Albany. There is no powerful mode to expand either the numbers or the financing, let alone the terms of access. The really critical issue of the state university is to keep open 64 campuses because there is a political constituency for each one of them. And our studies show that the spending on each campus affect a considerable amount of employment and gross domestic product in each of these 64 counties. Unfortunately, CUNY can't do the same thing because the uh, economic base isn't there. We're about to see, probably it's rumored, the most effective piece of adversarial debate, which will come out of Dano Schmidt's commission, <laughs> which will not only revise all the numbers about whether remedial education has any place whether it is a total failure, whether the retention rates uh, show that it is a disgrace, whether it is shown that it is not cost effective, because here is an issue which I want to brought up, which is that part of the adversary debate is privatize the system. And in this case, the rumor is, it comes along with the Edison project, we have shown that if you privatize the schools and you have charter schools, you might as well privatize remedial education. 
Now, obviously, we need to consider what is on the other side of the debate. And we haven't been doing so this morning. I'd suggest two things which we should look at. The first is the way in which a constituency was rabbit, Dr. Kaplan put it so aptly of coalition building, called the saving of Social Security. Social Security is probably the last egalitarian piece of policy on a major scale in our society, and a, a coalition came together to say that, even in terms of the current debate over whether the budget surplus should go into Social Security or tax cuts. This is, has a bearing on who gets admitted into higher education. We heard the data, I mean, we've been working on this for a long time, I've been looking at the data on service sector industries in New York City and how they vitally draw them for all of their bank office operations, the grand yachts of the city university. Now the last point, because I want to get the answers, more than three quarters of the members of the state legislature are our graduates. <laughs> we don't get to them. We really don't get to them. We don't get to the people of the city council who talk about coalition building. And here's an expert in doing just this. But it is time that the universities did something in terms other than self-congratulation of demonstrating what it is that we do in society, what it is that we broaden, and to do it politically. And I suspect that when the uh, Schmidt Commission makes its report, this will be a major opportunity for us to respond, both on a sound academic level, but also in political terms. Uh, just a couple. I don't, have, I don't obviously know anything about how to organize political coalitions in New York State, but I, there were two or three uh, pieces of this. One is your general point uh, I, 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 about politics is that what you've said about New York is true everywhere. Whether it's, uh, there's, it's causal or not, I don't think. But the fact is, the more members of legislatures have college degrees, the harder it seems to have become for us to get money. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't explain that. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the second thing is, I think the, there's nothing more important, and that's why I don't know what the, the Schmidt Commission and uh, some of the people I talked to are on it don't seem to know what it's going to recommend. But it does seem to me that the it is in the, whoever succeeds in framing the issue will probably carry the debate. Uh, so if the issue is how do we develop the talent and skills that provide individual opportunity, it's like the welfare debate. If you define the welfare question in terms of how do we make people self-sufficient so they can be, you get one set of policy alternatives considered. If you ask the question, how do we get rid of the welfare queens, uh, 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 that you get another set of questions. So I think I, my own set is wherever you stand on this, recognize the fundamental debate. If, is this debate about getting the great, cleaning up higher education? Or is it about what is higher education's responsibility to develop the talent and skills of the people here? I mean, whoever, whoever gets to ultimately, to whoever succeeds in defining the question will make the basic value judgments. Uh, let me just say about remediation, there are two things that I think are, create real problems. Uh, one of them, uh, if any of you have seen David Brenneman's work, one, one of the leading economists of higher education in the country, was pretty conclusively demonstrated that this, whatever is driving this issue, it's not economics. It's, it's less than 1% of the total resources being spent on American higher education are being devoted to this. Part of it is because we do it so cheaply. A lot of it with part-timers, adjuncts. I mean, my, one could almost make an argument if this is an important function of American higher education, we should be doing it better, uh, and may, uh, you know, and maybe we'd be, it would be more effective. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, the second question, the second issue is, we've got this kind of remedial as remedial as remedial, like a rose is a rose, and so we're looking for one size fits all solutions. And I think there is a lot of good information. Cliff Edelman, a, a, a major researcher in higher education, has pretty well demonstrated that certain kinds of uh, uh, remedial issues probably can't be addressed by colleges and universities, people who can't read. But an awful lot of them can be addressed. People who need a uh, language or computation, and a lot of it can be addressed in a relatively short period of time with the consequence that people graduate at the same rate uh, as those who didn't 
need it. And all of us who have been to college, I mean, I went to Stanford at an advanced age. They had to give me an extra year to pass statistics. I hadn't looked at it for, so, so I, 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 I shouldn't be advertising that I was a remedial student. And a lot of people, if they had used that word, should have said, what the hell is this guy doing here? And maybe that would have been a good question. But I was taking the rest of the curriculum and doing just fine. And, and so I think we, as we try to frame this question, we shouldn't wait for someone, wherever you stand on it, to throw down the gauntlet. We need a lot of time and attention into asking what, what exactly is the nature of this issue and how does it affect the community and how do we want it to be perceived from 10 years out. And, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait too long for a, somebody to come along uh, that can be sort of demonized and let them define the question because I think that whether they meet your expectations or not, I think that's a kind of losing proposition. I, I think one, one of the tra traps that we're in, and I suspect it's not uh, only New York, uh, is that on remediation, for example, um, there are a lot of good brains in CUNY about remediation. There's been a lot of thinking that's gone into remediation, a lot of experience with it over the years. Uh, often when other systems around the country are looking for someone to think about this issue, they draw on someone uh, from CUNY. Uh, but by definition, the way uh, the situation has been framed now, those people would be defined as being too self-interested to be heard uh, in, in the way that they would need to be heard around this issue. So I think one of the things that, uh, that systems are grappling with is how do you make a credible statement uh, and who can you work with to make a credible statement about what you know to be facts and, and experience. Yeah, can I just add quickly to that? It seems to me the two, two huge issues we have is, is uh, it, this issue comes across as a public debate about those who support quality in education and people who don't. And no matter what side of the issue you're on, that is not the debate. If we don't disaggregate these questions a, a little more sensitively, we can't possibly come to decent solutions because we're asking the wrong questions. And, and the emotional part of this, even though, as I, as I, as I mentioned and others have, a, a third and a half of the students don't even come from high schools. If, if we could wave a magic wand in most urban areas uh, and fix the high schools tomorrow, that would still leave us with what to do about uh, people who are not coming to us out of high schools. But, the, but the, 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 the other issue is that this touches people's frustration about the public schools and, and those who want to deal with it in, on one side or the other in anything but a meat act way uh, keep coming across in the public debate as complacent about that too. And part of that, I think, is because we in higher education haven't done enough of paying our dues on the public school side, despite the good things we just heard about the, the New York uh, uh, high schools and some of the programs. Okay. Um, Julius Edelstein, and then I think we'll adjourn. Julius Edelstein. This woman is going to hold up her hand for the entire proceedings. I don't mind speaking after you. Okay. Dr. Callan, you referred in the course of your remarks uh, to uh, a phenomenon that we have had here in New York City uh, so uh, tellingly, and that is the politicization of the uh, governance process, which uh, is, in my uh, very long experience, is unexampled, at least in New York. And I would wonder how much of it is going on elsewhere, where uh, for political reasons, rather than any educational or even economic reasons, the uh, 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 boards of uh, trustees have been taken over by executive authority and uh, directed what to do in making educational decisions. Uh, can everybody hear the question? Yes. Uh, I'm worried about the issue of politicizing uh, trustees, not in the sense that I don't think in some ways these are political decisions. Who has access to opportunity in this country is a political decision. I also think on the other side, and I say this as a person who did, was not fond of what we did about affirmative action in California, but I think it was the people on the, uh, who claimed that the minute the regents started asking the question, this was politicized in it, even though five of the university's campuses were out of compliance with the region's own policy, the quota systems are not. So some of this politicizing is, yeah, the talk about politicizing is, I think, uh, used rather loosely and simply a way to tell people who disagree with you they have no part in the conversation.
conversation. On the other hand, I think your point is very well taken, and I think it is a the institution of trusteeship and public institutions is in some degree of trouble. There have been reports out of places like the Association of Governing Boards that have called on governor to use careful screening processes to appoint public trustees. It could well be that the, high, the huge mega system, uh, the highly centralized boards, uh, uh, encourage that in a way because they uh, uh, they make it impossible for trustees to be, a, I don't know how you're a trustee of a 23 campus system in any effective way as we as our, say, our state university system in California. So it sort of dealt them out of the action and then when they try to get back in, they do it sometimes in fairly inappropriate ways. I mean, our debate about remediation wasn't any better. So I do think we have to sort of figure this out to do this buffer state, uh, this, 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 what, what is the role of people who are supposed to come to these boards to represent society's interest in the institution, not just the institution's self-interest or that of its faculty and administrators and alumni, and how do we, uh, how do we get boards uh, that will do that, and if not, I think this institution will fail. I mean, in a lot of the rest of the world, as you well know, uh, college and universities are simply governed by a department of education or a ministry of education, and, and to the extent we uh, operationally behave that way, then the, the, the value of this institution, which most of us still, I think, is, think the idea of lay control is pretty, pretty important, uh, is there. So I think it's an issue we need to, uh, on one hand, be quite careful that we don't consider our political views to be neutral and our adversaries' political views to be intrusive. Uh, and at the same time, I think we have to realize that the notion of a trustee is somebody who makes their decision based on their uh, public responsibility for the long-term public interest of the institution and not their accountability to who put them there. And that's becoming a bigger and bigger problem across the country. Okay, last question. Hi, I'm Mary Sableson. I was in the uh, CUNY Coalition Against the Budget Cuts in 95, and I've been active since then. I just wanted to make a comment about the administration and funding and the trustees. Um, there is money in the city. There's five hundred million that's supposed to go to the new Yankee Stadium. So there's definitely money, and they cut that sort of money from CUNY um, and raise tuition. And um, the presidents of, the, of many of the campuses and the trustees were not supporting the students. They weren't fighting for the students, and that's why there was a thirty thousand student demonstration in '95. And uh, the mayor came out and called the students uh, bratty. He said that uh, they were illiterate, and uh, that's the kind of treatment that they've been getting. So I think that focus has to be put on the trustees and the administration. The, um, the president of City College um, called the CUNY police on us and had us arrested for having a hunger strike against the budget cuts. That's the kind of thing that these, these heads of, of, of many of the campuses and the trustees, that's what they've been doing, the trustees voted to, to cut these programs. So we do have to look at them. And I think when students come out, the only people who really come out and demonstrate to try to fight, this is the way they fight. You know, They don't have these connections with, with Albany or with the city. Then they need the support of the people around them instead of being treated like you know these crazy fanatics because they want their education. They want their future. So that's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. I should uh, just say in closing, thank you. Um, certainly in the history of uh, public and private higher education, students have been an important voice and have at many crucial junctures of City University's history. Anyway, our time is up. Um, I know some of you have to leave, so please go to work. The rest of you can stay and talk. Thank you. And thank you to our speakers. against the budget cuts in 95, and I've been active since then. I just wanted to make a comment about the administration and funding and the trustees. Um, there is money in the city. There's 500 million that's supposed to go to the new Yankee Stadium. So there's definitely money, and they cut that sort of money from CUNY um, and raise tuition. And um, the presidents of, the, of many of the campuses and the trustees were not supporting the students. They weren't fighting for the students, and that's why there was a 30,000 student demonstration in 95. 
and uh, the mayor came out and called the students uh, bratty. He said that uh, they were illiterate, and uh, that's the kind of treatment that they've been getting. So I think that focus has to be put on the trustees and the administration. The, um, the president of City College um, called the CUNY police on us and had us arrested for having a hunger strike against the budget cuts. That's the kind of thing that these, these heads of, of many of the campuses and the trustees, that's what they've been doing. The trustees voted to, to cut these programs. So we do have to look at them. And I think when students come out, the only people who really come out and demonstrate to try to fight, this is the way they fight. You know, they don't have these connections with, with Albany or with the city. Then they need the support of the people around them instead of being treated like, you know, these crazy fanatics because they want their education, they want their future. So that's my problem. Thank you. I should uh, just say in closing, thank you. Um, certainly in the history of uh, public and private higher education, students have been an important voice and have at many crucial junctures of City University's history. Anyway, our time is up. Um, I know some of you have to leave, so please go to work. The rest of you can stay and talk. Thank you. And thank you to our